Welcome, everyone. My name is Leah Terry Gonzeller. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Technion, and on behalf of the organizers, I want to welcome everyone to this webinar dedicated to religion and inclusive science communication. We would have hoped to have um, to hold this event in during more peaceful times, but we thank everyone for coming today and hope that this event will run smoothly. As many of you know, some of the participants have been under missile attacks over the past few days and might need to run for shelter during this webinar. So we, I will be honest by saying that we debated um, whether we might postpone this event or not, but despite pros and cons, we have decided to go ahead um, with plans and hopefully it will run smoothly. So we are here today to focus on a topic that has received growing attention, inclusive science communication. And the growing importance and interest of this topic can be seen easily by the vast array of participants who are joining us today from Australia, South Africa, Indonesia, Portugal, India, Brazil, Germany, UK, I think we have Slovenia, Canada, Indonesia, and the Netherlands, and I hope I didn't forget anybody. So welcome everyone. Um, and I would say that together with the di disproportionate effect of COVID-19, especially on ethnic and racial minorities, scholars of science communication are currently re revisiting models of inclusive science communication. And this um, kind of realization builds on more than a decade of research that has really highlighted various disparities in science education and communication. And even though there has been a really rapid growth in science information, access to science-related information and public engagement with science are still inequitably distributed. And the efforts of science communication and education still tend to benefit very specific and typically privileged groups. So um, while much of the research tends to focus on inclusivity in terms of gender or disability or race, today we suggest to focus on religion, asking um, and to try to think together how to focus on the ways science communication can be intentionally tailored for different religious groups. So um, taking our focus on science inclusion in the context of Haredi Jews, um, who are typically known as ultra-Orthodox, we have organized this event with two different sessions, one in Hebrew and one in English. We have already had the session in Hebrew, which was fascinating. And I welcome some of the people who participate in the first session um, again to this session. And I also want to welcome everyone who has joined us for this unique conversation about religion and inclusive science communication. So um, after my short introduction, we will begin with a presentation by Professor Bruce Lewinstein, who will offer a definition for inclusive science communication. Um, he, that will be followed by a Q&A, so you can keep your questions and we'll open up for after that. After the Q&A, members of the research team that I'm really lucky to be part of called Haredim and Science Communication um, will share their findings. We have a group working on reporters themselves and a group working on the content of science, inclusive science communication. And my team at the Technion um, with Yael Rosenblum and Ayelet Baram Tzabari. Um, but before um, we, we begin, I'd like to say a few words about Haredim, a religious minority that mostly lives in Israel, the US and the UK, and maybe just share why we've chosen um, to focus on um, inclusive science communication based on this particular case study. So ultra-Orthodox Haredi Jews um, live in accordance with the teachings derived from the Tanakh, from the Hebrew Bible, as well as a body of rabbinic literature that is constantly being interpreted. There are many groups of the ultra-Orthodox community, and I would I've, be careful to even say community, I would say communities. And we were going to address them as one today, but in our conversations, I'm always looking for more nuance, but we'll um, speak broadly for a second. <clears throat> and I think it's important for our conversation to know two things. One is that Haredim in Israel have a separate school, school system, and because they aim to prepare their children for very gender specific roles in society, men are supposed to become religious scholars and the women are supposed to become breadwomen, uh, breadwinners and domestic caregivers. So for this reason, STEM subjects are very sparsely taught in ultra-Orthodox schools. Most male students do not learn science beyond the grade of five or six, so beyond the age of 11 or 12, whereas women who are expected to go out and work typically learn a bit more usually till ninth grade. 
Um, and in the past, um, there has been um, a lot of, of, of efforts from the Israeli state to introduce basic scientific learning into the curricula. I believe that Lotem Peren Chazan is here with us, who's one of the um, people who works on that in Israel. But the other thing that I would say that is really relevant for our conversation on communication is that Haredim in Israel have their own sectorial press, which we'll hear a lot about today. The Haredi press has developed over the years. It's highly censored by intercommunal representatives and rabbis, which is part of the conversation that we had earlier. There are also typically no pictures of women um, in their media. And in the context of inclusive science communication, our conversation today, I think they offer a really intriguing case study to talk about how secular media um, fails to tailor um, communications that align with their community needs and side by side to try to look at the ways um, Haredim themselves create their own type of tailored science communication. So we really hope that this case study will spur a conversation about many of the other contexts you work with. Um, and we're happy to hear more about that in the Q&A. So with, after this brief introduction and without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Bruce Lewinstein. He is Professor of Science Communication in the Department of Communication and Science and Technology Studies at Cornell University. He is a widely known um, authority on public communication of science and technology. I know that many of the people here today have been inspired by his work. It's a true pleasure um, to have you here today. Um, so Bruce is going to um, speak for roughly um, 20 minutes. It will be followed by a Q&A, and then we will open up um, for a second session about um, Haredim and science communication in Israel with two wonderful respondents here, um, Dr. David Dyer and Professor um, Ayala Fader, and we'll hear about them later. But Bruce, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you, Leah. Thank you for that um, kind introduction. I will now do the classic Zoom thing of sharing my slides, which I hope you can now see. Um, and I hope you can also see uh, the automated transcript, which appears. This is in fact an aspect of inclusive science communication, which is recognizing that not everybody can hear, especially people for whom English may not be their first language and that even an imperfect transcript uh, may, may help some. I wanna begin with a land acknowledgement. I'm speaking to you today from Ithaca, New York. My institution, Cornell University, is located on the traditional homeland of the Gayakono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayakono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. Cornell as an institution and those of us associated with Cornell acknowledge the painful history of Gayakono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayakono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. So providing a land acknowledgement is important and not simply formulaic. Why? because it represents a recognition that many of the positions we take and the supports we take for granted are based on the work or the lives or the land of people who we have sometimes ignored and sometimes violently oppressed. And I'm well aware that my previous sentence may be heard differently in Israel than it is in, here in the United States. But the point of a land acknowledgement is relevant for a talk about diversity and inclusion. That's why I wanna continue with another disclaimer. I'm a representative of the majority. I'm an older white male who teaches at an elite American research university. That gives me a level of privilege that many people don't have. I will do my best to cite those whose ideas that I'm presenting because I do not wanna usurp or silence their voices. Indeed, what I'm hoping to do is elevate their voices to bring them more fully into our conversations about science communication. This meeting's focus on religion points to another challenge of inclusion, how it varies depending on the context and situation. In the United States, as someone who strongly identifies with Judaism, even if I'm not particularly observant, I'm in a minority. 
But in Israel, where this meeting is organized and focused, being a secular Jew puts me in the majority. And as someone who comes from a family of Zionists, but who's deeply troubled by many of Israel's current policies, I'm also aware of the complexity of what a land acknowledgement means in Israel, particularly as we heard at the beginning on this day when some of you are listening with only one ear because the other ear is listening for a missile alert. Okay, I promise to focus on my main topic now, but I think those introductions are important for setting the scene. Much of what I've learned about inclusive science communication comes from a conference of that name that started a few years ago and a collection of materials coordinated by Dr. Sunshine Menezes, a science communicator at the Metcalf Institute at the University of Rhode Island in the United States. Now, Dr. Menezes and I have been having a gentle conversation recently about whether inclusive science communication is even the right word. She wonders if we should just talk about complex science communication because the world is a complex place. I'm gonna stick with inclusive because I think there are some issues that have been excluded and they, we need to bring them in. First, what has been included? We know a lot about media content in the United States and Western Europe. We know a lot about people's attitudes towards science, again, mostly in the United States and Western Europe, but with some data from elsewhere. We know something about what various interventions have been achieved, again, mostly in the United States and Western Europe. You may be noticing a pattern. We know something about informal science learning. But what has been excluded? There are three main things that I think we want to focus on. So clearly, studies outside of the United States and Western Europe. There are some, but not many. Two, different knowledge systems. And three, understandings of science communication that bring in issues of gender and race and social power and religion. So let me talk some more about those. First, when I said that this is what we know, I'm talking about those of us who read and write primarily in English and who read primarily scholarly publications produced in the US and Western Europe. There's actually a lot of literature in Spanish, some in French, a lot in Chinese, a lot published in, Is in India in both English and local languages, a lot published in more local journals or circulated in other forms, and places like South Africa and elsewhere in Africa. I think there's some material in Russian. I could go on and on. The point is that the scholarly community needs to find ways to bring in the knowledge that's been developed outside of the elite scholarly publications in English. There have been some attempts to address this, but it's a recurring problem. And it affects our ability to make systematic statements about uh, what we know about inclusive science communication. There are lots of examples here. A Brazilian colleague, Diogo Lopez de Oliveira, and another colleague and I recently published a paper about science communication and COVID-19 in Brazil. Some of the tweets we analyzed referred to a concept called mandanismo, a peculiarly Brazilian concept expressing the power relationships between landowners and slaves. That idea appeared only because we looked at science communication in a different linguistic and national context. In Israel, I've been to a couple of the Israeli science communication conferences, but I only know about the material that was presented in English, not in Hebrew. Because language is a big part of this exclusionary process. Melissa Marquez and Ana Maria Porras, two Colombian scientists who are also active science communicators, have recently published about the problem of language. It's not just that English is not universally spoken. It's also that because of various social and economic inequalities, English in many countries is likely to be limited to the elites and thereby we're simply increasing the problems of social access to scientific knowledge. A related problem is that there are ideas like mandanismo that just can't be expressed in English. About 20 years ago, I was teaching a workshop in South Africa and a student posed to me this problem. The biggest health challenge in South Africa at the time was the spread of HIV and AIDS. 
and he wanted to write about using condoms to prevent transmission. But in his language, he said, there were no words for genitals. To talk about the act of sex, the words were literally, he falls on her. And I'm not even going to comment about the issues of violence embedded in those words. How, he wondered, could he explain the use of condoms when he had no word for penis? Second, I've talked about what we know about science communication. And by science, I mean, I mean mainly the big natural sciences, physics, chemistry, biology. We know something about some more specialized areas such as biotechnology, nanotechnology, the energy sciences, but we don't know anywhere near as much about the social sciences, that is to say, how to communicate them, what people take away. Nor has the science communication community been great until very recently about bringing in insights from the public health and nutrition communities, which have long traditions of very successful interactions with very diverse audiences. Although you could question what I mean by successful interactions. Um, we could get back to that during the discussion. So what is excluded? The biggest issue is different understandings of the natural world what are sometimes called traditional knowledge systems or indigenous knowledges. Lydney Orthea, a science communication researcher in Australia, has been particularly active in highlighting this issue. This isn't about saying that modern science is wrong and traditional knowledge systems are, uh, are right. Instead, this is about recognizing that traditional knowledge systems are often the way that different communities understand and relate to the world. Douglas Medine and Megan Bang, for example, have shown how critical it is to acknowledge different knowledge systems when you're trying to make science education more accessible for a diverse culture. The same thing applies across science communication. Finally, what's been excluded, what's been largely excluded is our understanding of how social power shapes science communication. Emily Dawson's work here is among the most important. She has shown how making science museums more accessible doesn't just mean putting signs in different languages or offering discounted admissions for low-income families. Those different communities need to see their own perspectives, whether it's racial or gendered or economic or religious, represented in the museum. You could see that in several of my language examples earlier the issue of economic power associated with the Brazilian Mandinismo, or the socioeconomic implications of communicating science in English. I didn't talk about, but we could talk about examples from issues of dis people with disabilities of various kinds, and so on. The social power issue is complex. A Colombian scholar, Tanya Perez Bustos, showed several years ago how a prominent Colombian scientist who happens to be transgender used her public presence to challenge how we conceptualize of conservation. The scientist, Brigitte Baptiste, moved beyond male notions of the control of nature to push public discussion about the care of nature using the ethics of care perspective that has been identified by feminist scholars. Other researchers, such as Stephanie Steinhardt and Britt Ray, have also shown how thinking about care can give us a different understanding of what the goal of science communication might be. Issues of power clearly force us to address race. In the United States, for example, we have a long history, terrible history, of racism against Black Americans. In the medical field, the most widely known example is the Tuskegee experiment in which poor black men who had syphilis were denied treatment in order to, in the eyes of the experimenters, follow the course of the disease. Even at the time it was begun, the experiment was poorly designed. Uh, this was in the 1930s. But then the experiment continued long after effective treatments for syphilis were available. I mean, 25 years long. One of the consequences of this is that African-Americans are quite justifiably suspicious of the medical establishment. In the current moment, that shows up as a deep reluctance to get a COVID-19 vaccine, even though African-Americans are being hit with the disease much more heavily than other communities. 
Now, this story is sometimes told as something we need to overcome. But what if we understand it not as a barrier and not as those people are outside science communication and we need to bring them in. Instead, we have to understand the worlds that the African American inhabit and why perspectives that challenge the expertise of science have real power in people's lives. And this brings us to religion. Religion brings in all the issues that I've raised above. Studies outside of the mainstream of the US and Western Europe, different knowledge systems, and different understandings of social power. One of the best known examples is evolution. For many people of faith, evolution challenges an understanding of the creation of the world. And this has led to conflicts worldwide uh, in various ways. Yet there are also ways in which evolution and faith can coexist. Scholars such as Eileen Howard Eklund have shown that many scientists, perhaps as many as half, do have some form of spiritual faith. For me, however, the best example or the most powerful example is one that I saw myself. About 15 years ago, I was helping to evaluate a citizen science project that involved watching birds, pigeons actually. For scientists, the data was gonna be used to study evolution. The project was being used often by the homeschooling community. Here in the United States, homeschoolers are people who have opted out of the public education system, often for religious reasons. In particular, their teaching of, the teaching of things like evolution. And yet these homeschoolers had adopted this citizen science project quite enthusiastically. Why, I asked some of the parents. It turned out that they knew about the evolution goal, but that's not important, they said. This project gets us and our kids out observing nature. And one of the best ways that we can pay tribute to the glory of God is to observe God's creation. So inclusive science communication means that I need to respect how the values of religious traditions and the values of modern science can overlap. Clearly, many religious traditions do this. In India, I've seen the great astronomical instruments created by Jai Singh drawing on multiple religious traditions. Literally minutes after typing that last sentence, I was talking with one of my students whose family are observant Hindus. And he said that his grandfather had never understood the neurobiology he was studying, but was quite interested in ideas about connections between Hindu gods and specific areas of the brain. Again, we see this overlap. In another example, much of what we know about Greek science and medicine uh, came to us through translations produced by Islamic scholars in the medieval years, including, of course, the Jewish philosopher, physician, and astronomer Maimonides. One of the most important points for us about this discussion is uh, about Maimonides is that his science does not lead us to question his importance in Orthodox Jewish religious thought. In modern times, of course, People point to the statistics that about 20% of Nobel Prizes have gone to people of Jewish origin. Given these overlaps and given the title of the definition that I foolishly gave the organizers, what can I conclude about defining inclusive science communication? I'm gonna turn to a report produced last year by Sunshine, Sunshine Menezes, who I mentioned earlier, and her colleagues, Kathleen Canfield and Christine Liu, as well as work that they've produced with other colleagues. The key feature of inclusive science communication, they said, is a focus on equitable relationships. And that focus appears across three traits. Intentionality, we need to pay explicit attention to how science is defined and how marginalized identities in science are and historically have been represented and supported. Reciprocity, interactions between science communicators and audiences need to address past and present inequities through equal partnership, which includes co-creation of projects and recognition of the variety of assets and forms of expertise that different communities bring to the interaction. And finally, reflexivity. We need continuous, critical, 
and systematic reflection on these issues of identity and practice and outcome, both for the communicators and for the audiences. And that has to be followed up with adaptations needed to address the thing, the inequities that we identify. So if I combine those three traits of intentionality, reciprocity, and reflectivity with the issues that I raised earlier, geographic and linguistic diversity, different knowledge systems, and issues of social power, we begin to get an outline of what inclusive science communication might be. Fundamentally, it's about focusing on the audience, not on the science. It's about listening, truly listening, to hear what the issues are in communities that are very different from the modern science communities, where we science communicators and science communication researchers spend our time. We need to work hard to truly inhabit the perspectives of other groups, whether they are racial or gendered or linguistic or religious. That means we have to go to uncomfortable places, listen to perspectives that deeply trouble us. We have to acknowledge our own privilege as with the land acknowledgement and accept that there are good reasons for other communities to be suspicious of us. We have to let go, at least temporarily, of our own assumptions about the value of science. It means we can't be defensive or we'll never be able to inhabit those other worldviews. But, if we can achieve that intentionality, reciprocity, reflectivity, it also means that we will have the opportunity to work with others, to build trust, to find common ground. We might come to some kind of shared synthetic vision, like those kids and the pigeon, where we achieve goals that are mutually satisfying to us both, even though we're motivated by different ends. Inclusive science communication can, I hope, help us move ahead to a world where more people have access to the kind of reliable knowledge that science, all kinds of science, as I said above, where more people have access to the kind of reliable knowledge that science provides. Tazaraba. Thank you so much for such an informative and I would say thought provoking start off to this conversation on inclusive science communication. Thank you so much for that. I want to invite um, if anybody has questions because this is a webinar so we can't see you but if any of the participants would like to post a question in the Q&A please feel free to go and do that. Um, so the panelists can raise their hands as Ayelet has just done. So I will ask a short question of my own and then um, uh, move the floor over to Ayelet. So one of the questions that I've been asking myself for a long time and you kind of hinted at in your presentation was the term that we use. So I'm really sure that we're on the right track here and there's such importance to this type of research. And I have to say that I am unsure about that word and I'm interested in hearing a little bit more of your reflection and your choice to continue using that word. And I, I'll say for me that my biggest hesitation is really just because it continues the power dynamics that are already existing instead of challenging them to some extent. So that's um, just a quick thought. And if you would like to um, offer a brief answer and then I yell it. Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is precisely what, what Sunshine said when she, and she, when, when she and I were talking, she said that she, even though she's one of the people who pushed the development of this language, she said part of what the process is, is constantly interrogating exactly what we're saying and what we're doing. And that's what's led her to be concerned about precisely the kinds of things that you're talking about, which is if there's an inclusion, then that involves some kind of social power with the people you're exclude that you are excluding. And I think there's, and that's why she's thinking about using just the word complex. Um, I think there's a lot of value to that. I'm not sure we're there yet in terms of being able to define what we're talking about. Um, I think it helps at least for heuristic purposes, as I said, to think about what's been excluded, what's been included in order for us to move past it. But I don't think we can move past it until we've been a little bit more thoughtful about what's on the inside and what's, what's traditionally been on the inside and what's traditionally been on the outside. 
Thank you so much. Ayelet, would you like to um, ask a question? Yes, thank you so much for this uh, really interesting talk, Bruce. Uh, my, my only concern is that when listening to you, it sounds like it's a, a good thing we can do and there's, it's a win-win situation. So we can do whatever we did before, but just add, like you added this uh, uh, transcript. So it's something we add. But it's not always like that. So I'm, if I'm thinking about the uh, Israeli context of ultra-Orthodox, then if I have a natural history museum and I have to decide if I put a, a human evolution um, exhibition there, if I put the human evolution ex exhibition in a, in a uh, very uh, visible place, then some people would exclude the museum. But if I don't do it, then I exclude the science that I want to show. So it's not only about inclusion, it's also about excluding some science. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a really important issue. And one of, the, one of the key points about what I was talking about is that it does require discomfort on both sides. So it's not just the scientists who have to be uncomfortable, the other communities who you're talking with whatever they're, with whichever of these dimensions we're talking about, have to be willing to engage. And that may require a level of trust, not necessarily in the museum. Maybe this thing is about doing some things outside of the museum to build the trust so that you can eventually move the conversation into the museum. I don't think it means the museum needs to give up talking about evolution. Uh, I actually took a line out of this talk because I was running long. Um, that uh, it, you know the classic line from Dobzhansky that without evolution, nothing in in biology makes sense. Um, and so, if you're a biologist, you you have to talk about evolution. But then that then leads to the why can we have this conversation? Why is it that many people find that they can live their lives? perfectly fine in a world where evolution is not part of the, the, um, the intellectual conversation. Um, and so it's that willingness to engage in that conversation that I think um, is critical and it has to be on both sides. It's an idealistic view of the world, I accept that. Um, but I, I guess I'm still willing to try to have some ideals. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a few questions in the chat and then I also see that your hand is raised. We will get to you in a second. So I want to um, uh, put a few questions here together. So um, Marina is asking, how can we nurture a new generation of scientists more willing to accept different worldviews? And I'm linking that together with Hagit's question who has asked, what are our goals of science communication for different misrepre misrepresented groups? Um, so that's two questions together, and then I'll put another two after that. Um, so those are the interesting questions. So I think you know part of the new generation of scientists, and and you know there's a lot of gray hair in this beard. So I'm talking about people significantly younger than me. But there is a change in the science community that happens. So I teach workshops for uh, science graduate students about um, how, how to communicate. And 15 years ago when I taught those workshops and I would ask the students, how did they find out about the workshop? Did their advisors say, hey, you might wanna take this? And about half the hands in the room would go up and then I would say, how many of you are afraid that your advisor is going to find out you're here? Mm -hmm. and the other half of the hands would go up. That was 15 years ago. Today, when I ask that question, I get like one little half hand um, on, on the fear. There's a tremendous change in the community that I think we have to recognize. Issues of social power are part of the conversation that younger scientists and their colleagues who are not scientists and their partners and their families and their children and so on are, are engaging in. And so I think there's actually an openness to this that some of us who've been in the field for a long time might not fully, you know, it's one of the things we need to inhabit um, is, that, is that other thing. 
So with that comes the second question about how do we bring in the, the concerns of the groups who've traditionally been marginalized. I think that because there is greater openness, there is greater opportunity for us to um, sit and hear, um, and I'm using that explicitly, sitting and hearing, not standing, not speaking, um, and listening to hear what those concerns are and how things that we might even have been doing for other reasons can be interpreted in different ways. So I went to a workshop last weekend, last week on anti-Asian hate racism here in the United States. And we were talking about how to make your classrooms more accepting. And there was a discussion about the strong cultural commitment to reserve in many Asian communities and to not putting yourself forward. And how that manifests in a class requirement where you give credit for class participation. And that there's an inherent bias there where you're expecting people to move forward, to speak up. And that therefore you actually have to think about, even at that sort of level of detail, how providing opportunities to contribute in the chat box or in a discussion board may provide other opportunities. So what we have to do is, list, is listen to these new other communities, hear what their concerns are and how they would like to be part of the conversation. What issues do they want to bring in? And that means we have to be quiet. Love, um, Bruce, thank you so much. I love the metaphor of us being quiet. It's so hard for so many of us to do. And I think that we have so much to learn um, by being quiet. Ayala, do you want to ask your question? And then I'll read um, a few more questions from the Q&A. Sure. It was just a comment, actually, that build on what Ayala uh, said, which is that in the Museum of Natural History in New York, lots of Haredim go, um, but they skip the dinosaur floor, which is on the fourth floor. So I, I think it's also important to acknowledge the kind of interpretive work that religious communities, the sort of agency that people have in terms of picking and choosing what works for them. Yeah, thank you, Ayala. I, you reminded me as well that um, in the Israel Museum, there's a Judaica section. And many times you will see um, ultra-Orthodox Jews standing at the entrance asking, where is it? <laughs> and they'll go through the museum and find the right section that they're interested in. So I, I, I appreciate that very much. So we have two more questions and then we're gonna move on to the next part of this really interesting session. So Ronen is asking, can you reflect on the relations among the scientist community science communicator triangle. And um, Ben Kastan is asking, how do we appreciate that science is not a neutral body, but also at times political? So how do we acknowledge that in science communication? Yeah, so part of that is acknowledging that. And this is often very difficult for scientists who Part of the training is to say, I'm trying to keep the politics out. I'm trying to just look at the data. Part of the reflexivity that scientists need to have and their willingness to listen to others is, for example, listening to those of us who are historians or sociologists of science, for whom the idea that there's a politics to science is so trivial that it's like we, we, we do it in freshman, we do it in, in our freshman classes and expect the students get it, right? Because the the fact that government agencies make choices about what to fund. I'm not questioning whether, if, if, if you, we were in a room, I would be pounding on the table here and saying, I'm not questioning whether the table is here. I'm questioning what the politics are of why we study tables and not chairs, or certain kinds of health problems and not other kinds of health problems, or certain kinds of physics problems and not other physics problems. Um, that's a reflexivity that scientists need to take on board. Because many science communicators do come from the science community, it's also something that science communicators have to take on board. And this is challenging because for many science communicators, the goal is to help more people be able to use the, get the benefits of modern science. And so having to step out of that and saying, you know, there's a reason, it's not that people just don't know, there are some real 
systematic reasons why people not only don't listen or don't hear what we have to say, but actually actively resist what we, who, the very fact that we are saying that um, is part of the resistance. And so I think there's a, there's a reflection there that has to happen. I think one of the things that can happen is, in fact, to acknowledge that politic and to talk about that, to, to, to not be silent about the racism or the sexism or um, other kinds of bias that is there and say, look, I acknowledge that that's happened in the past and that I may not even recognize how it's still happening today. Tell me what your experience is. Tell me what it is that you see that I'm not seeing because only then will I be able to begin to address it um, and then be quiet and listen. So we have one last question um, that is maybe a bit of the opposite of listening, but maybe that's part of the answer. Um, so Don McDonald is in the UK and asking, um, I think you're right that there's a culture change among younger scientists, but if we wait for those people to become dominant in the power structures within science, then it will take decades. So is there anything we can do to speed this up or do we just have to be patient? What has to happen is that people like me with all this gray hair need to give voice to the people who are still um, coming up. Um, this is, there's this paradox here, right? I have a platform. You invited me because I'm well known, right? And I'm older and I've been around. David read a paper of mine 25 years ago. Um, but, um, but 32. Yeah. 32, 32 years ago. <laughs> um, uh, but that means that I have to be willing to say, you know, it's actually not my ideas that are important now. They're, they're useful, you know, don't completely ignore them. But I want to give a platform to these ideas from other people, from people who are younger, people whose voices are not as easily presented. Um, and that's part of my obligation as a senior person in the field to give to, to elevate the voices of others. Um, so it's, yes, it may be my mouth speaking the words, but as I said at the beginning, I'm hoping that I'm giving credit to the younger and active people who are themselves driving this conversation. Thank you so much. Can I, if, it, if I can, I wish more people understood that and, um, and were as generous. Um, so we are going to move on to the second part of the session and if people still have questions as we go through these other presentations, feel free to put it in the Q&A. We will have time for another Q&A towards the end. Um, so the second part um, of this session is really focused on diving into the context of religion through the case study of Haredi ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel. And to do so, we will be sharing findings from our research group which is three different groups, two located in the University of Haifa and the group that I'm part of in the Technion. So we'll have three presentations of about eight minutes each, and we'll have some responses to those um, uh, presentations. And what I would ask is to say, um, well, I will be um, presenting on behalf of my team, uh, Ayelet and Yael, and I think it's a really powerful um, COVID case study to how um, sometimes um, science communication and religion really goes wrong. And then we're, we'll move to Yariv and Oren Anachi, who will speak about potential ways to think about what are the benefits and costs of doing tailored religious science communication. Um, so I don't think I need to introduce myself. I think you've heard enough of me, but I will just um, share the screen and we'll start um, here. Can everybody see? Great. Okay, so um, COVID-19 has revealed entrenched structural inequalities, but also the need to understand the diverse ways that health, healing, and risk are conceived and practiced. Before the pandemic hit, we had already began a research project studying science communication among Haredi Jews in Israel, our team at the Technion, which included Yael Rosenblum and Professor Yael Baram Tzabari, 
We came together because we were worried about the consequences of limited science education and communication for the health and well being of Haredi Jews. While scholars have highlighted how science communication reifies forms of structural inequality, primarily gender, race, and disability, we argue for another important um, front for inclusive science communication, religion. So as the COVID-19 uh, pandemic shifted from East Asia to Europe and then to North America, the public media began reporting the disproportionate effects of the pandemic on minority groups. In response to this alarming data, scholars of science communication called to rethink the analytical tools employed to examine science communication among ethnic and racial minorities. On June 17, 2020, the Standing Committee on Advancing Science Communication devoted a special webinar to the topic. And I would say that this debate is grounded in a decade of research that has highlighted various disparities in science education and communication. And even though there has been a rapid growth in science information, access to science-related information um, and public engagement with, with science are still um, inequitably distributed um, um, and um, in a recent manifesto arguing for this model of inclusive science communication, uh, Canfield and her colleagues argued that as a result of science communicators' cultural and epistemological tunnel vision, their efforts tend to benefit specific, affluent, college-educated, non-disabled audiences. And Emily Dawson commented that to continue with business as usual is to be complicit in practices that uphold and exacerbate racism, class discrimination, sexism, and other forms of oppression. So even though these studies have highlighted the way science communication reifies these existing forms of structural inequality, um, we are really interested in the particular challenges posed um, by science communication um, for religious communities, which has received much less attention, attention. So to put it simply, we ask, how do religious minorities engage with and learn about science in their everyday lives? Is conventional public health messaging effective when dealing with the minority population with specific cultural practices and religious beliefs? And what are the limits of receptivity of science and health advice among specific minority groups? So to understand the meaning making process of Haredi men and women regarding science and health related data, we interviewed 20 men and women a process which we began before COVID and continued after. In addition, an online questionnaire was um, administered to collect participants' stances regarding culturally specific COVID-19 related dilemmas. So we gathered a lot of information um, and primarily asked about these dilemmas that incorporated a potential conflict between health considerations and religious norms. And these dilemmas were especially powerful as Haredi Jews have been disproportionately affected by COVID in Israel, as well as um, in the US um, and in the UK, as well as, as, well as other ethnic and um, racial minor, minority groups. Um, and um, I would say that the pandemic provided an unexpected setting to examine um, our questions. Um, and in our paper that we've published um, in science communication, I seem to be having the wrong paper, but I allow you can enjoy this one. Um, but um, so what I want to say is that we found that um, Haredi men and women um, made COVID-19 related decisions that drew both on religious and health medical related ra re rationalizations. But there was one particularly striking dilemma in which religious justifications and language really dominated. And this was the closing of religious seminaries. So when participants were asked what they thought about the Ministry of Health's decision to close all schools, universities, and religious seminaries, most respondents agreed that the decision to close all schools and universities was correct, but only 23% agreed with the decision to close religious seminaries. So this points to this disparity between the ways public health guidelines and regulations are perceived in the context of general education as compared to the ways guidelines should be applied in a religious context. So in the context of the pandemic, even though the comparison between schools and religious seminaries was fairly intuitive for Israeli policymakers and reporters, 
from a Haredi perspective, the government decision to close all religious seminaries was perceived as shutting down the heart of Jewish life. And this constant comparison between religious seminaries and schools reflected how public policymakers and commentators ignore aspects of Jewish life that are essential according to Haredi frameworks. So as Rivka, one of the participants in our study said, religious seminaries and the army are the same. It's a home and there's no reason to send them home. They can maintain the guidelines there. So for Rivka, the comparison between army and religious seminaries is the correct comparison. One that equates um, the importance of studying um, Torah with the army as different ways of maintaining a Jewish state, an ideal that has provoked constant controversy in Israel as Haredim typically do not enlist into the army due to this ideology. But this difference signals a socio-cultural gap in sense-making, as well as a pushback by a potent minority against intrusive state governance. So when the pandemic spread in Israel, these tensions also kindled Haredi suspicion of the true intention behind the decision to shut down religious seminaries and synagogues. And we've spoken a lot about suspicion already. So here's, I think, a really powerful example. And in light of these findings, we argue that it's really urgent to develop better communication models that are aligned and resonate with local communal understandings while taking state religion relationality into account. So tailored communication could allow reporters to understand what is at stake according to Haredi worldviews and could foster creative ways to bridge these thorny state religion tensions. So this study also provides detailed attention to how conventional public health messaging may or may not be effective when dealing with a minority population with specific cultural practices and religious beliefs well beyond this particular case study. So building on studies that have shown the importance of tailored and inclusive science communication, we also offer some examples as to how science communication may be tailored to particular religious minorities, such as translations, thinking about the mediums, the images, which we can discuss more during the Q&A. But to give one example, as mentioned earlier, the guidelines that ultra-Orthodox Jews found most challenging was the closure of religious seminaries. And this particular challenge and the tension it invoked could have been mitigated much better if public health messaging and science communicators conveyed and demonstrated that policymakers acknowledge and understand how challenging these guidelines are culturally, religiously, and politically. Thank you. So I would like now, before we open up to a Q&A, to introduce um, uh, two groups of colleagues that will present um, to us maybe a mirror case of if I was trying to show um, all the pitfalls um, of not doing tailored science communication, I'd like um, to introduce Oren Golan and Nachi Mishol Shauli, our colleagues at University of Haifa, who have been working on the ways Haredi reporters actually tailor science communication. Um, so Oren is, um, um, Dr. Oren Golan, um, is um, a faculty member at the Faculty of Education at the University of Haifa. He is one of the leading scholars on digital religion that focuses on ultra-Orthodox communities. Um, Nachi um, is a doctoral student in the Faculty of Education at Haifa, and his PhD looks at ultra-Orthodox Jews um, and uh, science communication, and together they will present um, some of their findings. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Leah, for that great intro, intro, and also for connecting, I think, um, the, the idea, different ideas. And, and our work uh, mainly focuses um, what, what in, 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 the pro, in the overall project, we, we, we dedicate our efforts to look at, um, at the mediators themselves, at the people who do the science communication, which are the journalists. Um, a, the journalists in the uh, ultra-Orthodox community and their role in this whole mess of, um, a, of mediating um, science to religious um, and indigenous communities. So, um, and in our my group, it also I should say that it's it, it includes me and, and Nachi, of course, who is going to speak in a moment. 
and but also um, Ms. Leah, Leah Fried and Ben C. Schwartz, who are also a part of our research team, and they are of the community, of the Haredi community, and they have been very, very uh, essential um, members so of the team. So, um, so uh, um, let's move on to the next slide, please, uh, Nachi. Um, I, I, I'll begin by saying that um, the, uh, when we talk about science communication, we, we and, and this is borrowing on, on, on Bruce's work and also um, Ayelet's work, and I can say that um, um, science communication refers to the transfer of knowledge from um, scientific experts to public audiences and is considered a major um, building block in modern um, societies that advance democratic ideals, health concerns, promoting economic growth, and guide policymakers in multiple fields. So these are things that are really essential to modern society. And at the same time, when we look at religious and reclusive communities, um, we can think about a lot of um, differ, different um, a, a, a conflicting epistemic um, ideals and, and with, a lot, um, with a lot of emphasis on social boundaries, which are at odds which are a lot, with a lot of the um, tenants that are, are connected with, with, with science and scientific communities. Um, we also had a, um, a talk about this in our, in our earlier session about the, um, at the relations between science and religion. So, um, but we now within this, um, within these two different um, worlds and epistemologies, we can think about um, mediating agencies. And here comes um, the, the rise of um, um, what is called religious journalism. We know religious journalism in Europe, in the US and also in Israel, we can talk a lot about religious journalism and how they bring in different these two different worldviews. So on the one hand, you bring in um, the um, the journalists that bring in a modern kind of um, way of reporting um, of information and bringing all kinds of um, information, wh which um, has developed a set of guidelines, ethical guidelines, a certain commitment to popularity. You always want ratings, and that's very important for journalists. And um, and in all that world, um, and a, a sort of a certain a commitment to truth uh, giving and, and, and the whole thing. And on the other hand, you have to, there's the religious sensibilities that come with being a religious journalist and adhering to a grounded authority that is connected to a community at hand. So that, um, with, with, and with, now within this world, there is a rise of, of, of in the agency of um, journalists and religious journalists, they, um, the whole journalists that become power brokers, and also a molders of a, an epistemic knowledge that might be a kind of a mix or an, an interchanging between these two different worlds. Um, and they have to sort of connect and mediate them. Now within the ultra-Orthodox world in Israel and also in the US, it should be said that uh, many of them, uh, the people are not exposed to non-Haredi press outlets. Some are, um, but, but many are not. So um, for them, the, these platforms are, ex, um, are um, are very important and, and it's important to look at them and look at what their journalists are saying, that was what we think, um, to say what they are, th their creed and what is their a mission in, in the sense of, of delivering um, uh, information, including scientific information. Now, you know, in the past, um, I mean, it began 100 years ago, but in the past 20 years ago, there's been a, a massive upsurge in the Haredi press, which has spread on not only to the print press, and there are differences, which I'm not going to get into, uh, but also into other forms, um, other venues, including the online press and radio and other forms. So, so there's um, there are different forms of press on, on telephones and other ways. And and also we should say that there um, is uh, within the when we read these newspapers, there's usually an emphasis on communal press and um, and and political or economic discussions and things that are concerning the community and concerning the Haredi world but less stress on science, um, although there is some, and we of course uh, look at that as well. So what we're looking at is uh, when we interview these, um, these um, um, journalists is how are, are they legitimizing and negotiating scientific, if at all, negotiating scientific knowledge um, and the dissemination, dissemination um, within this wor these worlds. Nachi, please um, take us on. Nachi, are you with me? Yeah, of course, on mute. My name is Nachin, and we'll talk a little bit about the findings. We found the religious journalists to do an epistemic adaptation process comprised of three phases. The first phase... 
Nachi, maybe we should say something about the methodology, maybe something. Oh, um, there is, I don't know where the methodology went, but we interviewed, we did in-depth interviews with 25 religious journalists and editors from various platforms, the web, the printed magazines and the printed dailies and radio. This is the methodology. And these are the phases of the process we found. So first of all, the religious journalist personally evaluates the taboos and the danger in the information. All the journalists we interviewed acknowledged the usefulness and importance of science, but also the few taboos that they resent as countering their faith. We see, for example, uh, I don't think there is really any tension. Everything can be reconciled. I, I believe in the Torah, but I also believe in science. And I know there must be ways to show that both are right. After this personal evaluation, they take into account the contingent uh, communal sensibilities to the specific subject they want to report about. They, um, and they are immersed in their communities. When we talk about inclusive, since they are of the community, they are well aware of the modesty norms and communal geist, if one might say, the word contingent issues. So they take them into account. And finally, they tailor the epistemic translation that will fit their crowds the best. So how they do it? In general, we found that they avoid writing on controversial issues and frame their reports in universal and pragmatic ways. Here we have a citation about, of a reporter that acknowledges that no one will go into his reports to learn about basic science knowledge. They want to read something useful, something that will help them. Back so, to Ori. So, yeah, just to conclude a few notes. Um, first of all, we found that there's a sort of a strategic management of science dissemination. There are several phases that they, that they, they went through. Uh, uh, quickly that um, that they that they uh, sort of process that they work through and they have a, a very very sp um, designed way of looking at the uh, doing these things. Um, they do a lot of epistemic work, um, negotiating and fitting fitting the boundaries of science to to the sensibilities and to the um, and things that are acceptable to their um, to what they think is acceptable to their communities at hand. And um, and some, and and Mary, maybe ironically or paradoxically, I would say that the enclave's boundaries is not threatened by science, but is rather sort of um, in, in sort of colored by by the way by the they take the science, they color it in their own um, colors and try to and their own uh, filters, and it actually helps them um, fasten their boundaries through this kind of science integration. So so that's it. Thank you. Oren and Nachi, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm gonna push us on to our last presentation from our group before we open up to their respondents. Um, I'm, um, I'd like to introduce Professor Yariv Tzfati. Yariv is the head of communication department at University of Haifa. And um, behind the scenes of this presentation is um, we're going through thousands and thousands <laughs> of, um, um, of, uh, of press, both um, in the secular and Haredi press. And um, Yariv um, works a lot on issues of public opinion and trust in the media. And um, I'm happy to present him and his work for our, for our last one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have to acknowledge the, uh, the hard work by, uh, by our graduate students, Noam Shoshani and Doron Ron, who coded all these, uh, uh, all these uh, worked hard on the reliability and coded all these uh, news stories. Uh, so uh, the previous presentation uh, stressed the adaptation process by Haredi journalists in order to achieve uh, an inclusive science communication. And this part of the project examined the output of the work, uh, the way science is covered by the Haredi press in comparison to the uh, secular press. And we're going to wonder about how these outputs represent inclusive science communication in the last slide. So I think it is obvious to this, cra to this crowd uh, to talk about the importance of studying news coverage of science. Uh, 
research both in Israel and worldwide shows that media is a, is a major source of knowledge uh, for, for citizens, um, uh, the scientific knowledge of citizens. And uh, in this part of the project, we, uh, we simply content analyzed uh, items reporting on scientific research in the Israeli press, both in the, uh, we had a sample of uh, Haredi press uh, online and, uh, and, and uh, print, and, uh, and the parallel sample of national uh, widespread secular outlets, uh, all the daily newspapers, uh, major, uh, major websites are included. Uh, the, we, we searched in uh, the archives of uh, IFAT Media Research Center, they're a private company who, uh, who uh, basically uh, archives and sells and uh, uh, media clips for commercial and scientific uh, purposes. Uh, we, um, we played quite a bit with the search terms and we ended with uh, quite inclusive uh, search terms, scientific research or new research or, or research in a wide array of, uh, of study fields. Um, just because uh, when, we, when you open up the search term and include professors, you, you get a lot of unrelated uh, uh, stories, not dealing directly with science. Uh, at present, I'm going to talk only about the first 100. Uh, it took us more than a year to achieve reliability for the coding um, for this project, and we are just uh, ended the first uh, 100 items. Uh, but we, we have plenty of work ahead in coding the rest of the sample. First of all, in terms of the quantity of coverage, uh, the quantity of coverage we found for the search query in the, in the Haredi media and in the secular media was, was quite small and, uh, and, and fairly similar. Uh, there are differences, but not, not tremendous. In, and in general, I'm going to open up and say that the differences we found were smaller than those we anticipated when we envisioned the project. When we look at scientific uh, topics covered, these are significant differences, but not dramatic differences. The Haredi uh, uh, media covers more health and uh, social economic issues. Uh, the secular media, um, a little bit more about animals and the universe and, uh, and um, uh, history. Uh, but these are not dramatic differences. When we look at sources, um, the secular media sources more and uh, more scientists and more females. Perhaps one of the reasons we see the differences in sources is that some Haredi outlets do not quote females or try avoiding, avoiding quoting uh, females. So, uh, so uh, again, these, there are differences, but not uh, dramatic. What you see here is not even statistically significant. Uh, in terms of the framing of science, we see more um, uh, interpretations and uh, references to science as representing uh, the future progress um, and, and advancement and, and scientific importance in the secular media. Uh, on the other end, we see more, uh, more references to possible risks and uncertainty related to science. Uh, more references to policy or regulation relevance of scientific research in the secular media. Again, these are not dramatic uh, differences, and I think this, uh, this uh, chart is even not significant statistically. Um, so all in all, we find little differences. I want to point out to three uh, reasons. Perhaps uh, some of the problems are with our analysis, the findings do not reflect the fact that some specific scientific issues are not or are seldom discussed by the ultra-Orthodox media in Israel. Uh, these issues are also not very frequently covered in the, in the secular uh, uh, press, evolution, for example. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but the, the way we coded perhaps uh, conceals this uh, 
uh, lack of reference as to some of the issues. Some of the findings, for example, the prevalence of health issues in, in Haredi media, um, reflect uh, what Nahi and Oren just reported, uh, Haredi journalists' perceptions of their mission to bring uh, practical knowledge to their audience. And the third reason may be that both Haredi and secular media are shaped by similar sources. It's the spokesmanships of the universities and press releases and stories covered by, uh, by major uh, world outlets uh, and, the, uh, and the health providers in Israel. And uh, um, this leads me to the last, uh, maybe open uh, slide. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure comparing the Haredi uh, to the uh, secular uh, um, press is, is a good drill in investigating inclusive science communication, because perhaps we're using uh, just a, a bad benchmark. Uh, perhaps the similarities reflect the shallowness or the other problems we have with science communication in the general population. Um, so perhaps we're using the, the, wrong, uh, uh, the wrong drill. Uh, when, when thinking about the way Bruce has defined inclusive science communication, I don't think the investigation of the text could give us answers about uh, intentionality or reciprocity and reflexivity that Bruce has discussed. Uh, just because the text is an output and, and Inclusive science communication, as defined by, uh, by Bruce, is, is more of a process. Uh, I think there are indicators in, uh, in our project at large, in what Oren and Nachi discuss, uh, of, of adaptation, translation, um, of listening to and, and, uh, and uh, refining the message when communicating with the Haredi uh, sector through the media, but I'm not sure uh, um, it's, it's the full process as Bruce has defined it uh, earlier. So by that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much for listening and questions and comments are welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yariv. Um, we are moving on to um, some comments and reflections. Um, the first person commenting is going to be Professor Ayala Thader. Um, she is Professor of Anthropology at Fordham University. Um, she um, is the author of Mitzvah Girls, Bringing Up the Next Generation of Hasidic Jews in Brooklyn, which won the Jewish Book Award in 2009. And she has a recent book out that I highly recommend everybody to go buy. Um, called Hidden Heretics, Jewish Doubt in the Digital Age. And I think that um, also the first book, but especially the second um, book positions, Ayala, and her work on ultra-Orthodox Judaism, media, publics, counter-publics, as the per perfect person to um, offer us some comments, maybe from the American uh, context, but we're looking forward um, to your comments. Thank you, Ayala. Thank you so much, Leah. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I think this is a really great collaborative research project. And to me, and I guess I'll also respond to Yariv with some ethnographic questions, but I think the focus on Haredi journalists, the content and the consumers is a really great angle. Um, the work raises so many questions for me and uh, I'll try to just pose a few and make some comparative comments so we can have discussion. But um, I was especially happy to be here because I'm trying to work out some of these very same issues and questions in the US context. So I'm glad to be able to um, think through some of this with you all. Um, as Leah mentioned, my own perspective comes from having done research on Haredim in New York for many years. Um, and my most recent book, Hidden Heretics, is about a crisis of authority that's centered on digital media and religious doubt. So the potential for media to offer something different in terms of expressions of dissent is of course something that people have studied, including Oren here. But more recently, um, I've gotten very interested in some of the public health crises among the ultra-Orthodox, um, particularly in New York. And I followed the 2019 measles epidemic very closely. Um, and now of course the COVID pandemic. For the US context, I think we would include some more local issues 
around um, state and city law in conflict with Haredim, which is Mitzitza Bepeh, and some of the issues that yeshivas are having in terms of how much secular education that they are um, either giving boys or not giving boys. I think what I and you all are seeing is a changing relationship to the state, which is you report, which is something that you all reported on. Um, and I think that that kind of conflict really requires some unpacking. It's questions such as like, what and who is the state? How are we conceptualizing the state? Um, I think of some of Michal Kravaltovi's recent work on how the state winks in Israel, really nuancing Foucauldian ideas about that all-seeing panopticon of the state and its bureaucracy. Um, and I, to me, this is really where the importance of ethnography as a methodology comes in, especially ethnographies of power and authority. Um, and of course, that's something that Leah has also worked on in terms of rabbinic authority and the ways that families and women negotiate their own agency. Um, in terms of the pandemic, relationships to the state, how it's imagined, who is represented by, access, all of these issues are ethical questions at the end of the day. And again, I think they require ethnography. So my first question is really about how the state gets mediated for Haredi communities. I love your concept of the broker, the Haredi journalist, and I'd love to know more specifics about their training, who they are, are they similar to the other kinds of brokers that I and other people have written about? I'm thinking about some of the um, women's magazines, for example, Mishpacha, and Bina, um, at least that's how we say it in New York, um, where, um, you know, from what I've heard, there's a man in the back reading Vogue and Cosmo, and a Haredi man in the back of, the, of their office reading Vogue and Cosmo, and then he translates that um, for a from readership, a religious readership. My other question is, who do those Haredi journalists answer to? And what about the Haredi news agency, things like Kol Mavasar, where are they getting funding? I, I'm really interested in terms of the, the media organizations in terms of the broader Haredi um, power structure, basically. Um, because we all know that the rabbinic leadership, at least, has the ability to close places down or to censor certain kinds of ideas. And so I think that's, that's important to get out there. Number two, um, question number two is, in the States, I'm seeing some crossover exchange of information from the non-Jewish world. Um, in what to me was some sort of surprising crossover exchanges of information. So in terms of alternative health and suspicion of public health programs in particular, um, I know that some of the anti-vaccine parents who were predominantly women, which tells us how important it is to really consider gender too, but some of those anti-vaxxer ultra-Orthodox parents, um, going back to the measles, even before the COVID vaccine, we're listening to people like Del Bigtree and Andrew Wakefeld, discredited, of course, but I mean, during the measles crisis, Andrew Wakefeld was invited to upstate New York to Rockland County to give a lecture. Hundreds of people came. Um, he's the, the doctor, of course, who um, connected MMR vaccines to autism, which has since been debunked, and he himself has been debarred, or whatever that's called for doctors. Um, I'm also thinking about a pamphlet on anti-vaxxing for measles that was circulated in a lot of ultra-Orthodox communities. Very, very difficult to find out where that information is coming from. It was eventually traced to a modern Orthodox woman, um, but those networks have been quite secretive. And I'm, I'm wondering um, about the kinds of suspicions that are going on in terms of the secular state and, and who's meeting, mediating that. So, so this question is really about, are there similar anti-state, anti-public health programs, but perhaps also Jewish or more secular or a different denomination um, that are having are creating these kinds of networks um, where different kinds of information is being exchanged, specifically science uh, skeptical information. Uh, my third question is about science skepticism in the US. Um, there is often among science skeptics in the stuff that I've been reading, less of a denial of science and more of an emphasis on issues of trust, not trusting the experts. And often that kind of critique is in the language of what um, Steve Shapin has called hyperscientism. It's a critique of the trust that constitutes science and a trust in those scientific expertise, um, but using the language of science. And so, um, you know, suggesting that science just hasn't tested enough, doesn't know enough. And I've seen this in some of my research now with anti-COVID vaccines, um, 
there's a poster that was posted on the walls in Brooklyn um, of two little mice talking in Yiddish. Um, and one of the mice saying to the other mice, like little lab mice, you know, I wouldn't take that vaccine, would you? And the other said, no, they haven't done enough testing. This, the data just isn't solid. Um, and so um, I think what we're seeing there are interpretations of scientific data and scientific knowledge, but reaching different conclusions. And so I see this question as related to your finding that scientific discourse is downplayed and that science becomes advice. I thought that was a really fascinating um, insight that you made. And I wondered if you could say more about this. It reminds me of an excellent sociological study by Jennifer Reich of anti-vax parents long before this pandemic happened in 2016, right? But these parents um, who really span religious and political divides um, claim expertise over their kids um, and they want to use physicians for advice and consult, not an authoritative relationship. So it becomes about individuals' own autonomy and expertise. Um, I have a few more questions. Can I keep going? Leah? Do you want to take one more minute? Yes. Okay. That sounds good. I didn't realize there were so many. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I guess I'll just end with this last one, which is that I thought it was really a fascinating suggestion that you made um, about the culturally insensitive comparisons between yeshivas and schools that the Israeli state was making. Um, and that was a kind of stumbling block perhaps for state public health officials to get their points across. Um, I think that that assumes that the issue is one of knowledge that Haredim simply don't have enough scientific knowledge or at least knowledge that is expressed in a way that they will accept it. Um, and the assumption again is that better communication will get that. And I wasn't so sure that I agree with that. I think that there are sometimes diff simply different agendas that really um, appeal to different notions of truth and futurity and, and where things like expertise um, really lie. So I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you, Ayala. I have like a million answers and questions <laughs> back and forth, but we are going to move on um, uh, to David. Um, so um, Dr. David um, Rear is a senior lecturer at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Bar Ilan University. He's a medical sociologist, works on sociology of science and public health, and has particularly done a lot of work on uh, women's public health and ultra-Orthodox women in particular. Um, so um, I'm really um, excited to hear um, what kind of thoughts um, these presentations um, bring to your mind, and I'm looking forward to some questions, and then we'll open this up. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for including me in this panel. I learned a lot from everyone, and it was great to meet everybody, to know that you're out there um, and what everyone is working on. Um, whenever I participate in something like this, I'm always a little confused about precisely how I got invited and precisely how I'm supposed to respond because I have kind of two different types of hats. Um, I have the public health, medical sociology, sociology of science and knowledge hat. Um, and then I have the, the other hat that I'm a member myself of the Haredi community. And I'm never sure which one I really was expected to be wearing when I answer. Um, very often, I find that the most useful hat I have is as a sociologist of science and knowledge. Um, so without, without worrying too much about which of, you know, where, where my comments come from, we'll just, I'll just deal with it that I'm a fusion of some sort with both worlds. And the comments come from, from that mixture. Um, one thing that uh, struck me that it applies to each of the three talks. Some of my comments are specific uh, and some of them are um, more general across all of the, uh, all of the um, uh, papers, is that maybe because I'm also Haredi, I, I've noticed something that um, I think philo philo uh, philosophically or epistemologically is a question of incommensurability. Um, I can switch hats comfortably. I live in both worlds. I teach, I'm a full-time academic sociologist. I was a AIDS researcher for 25 years and I'm a member of the Haredi community. And I never really had that much problem until I started sitting on COVID panels and I was expected to, you know, like Haredim and COVID, that kind of thing. Then I really started having trouble 
particularly with the issue that a lot of people mentioned for good reason, the question of the yeshivas. You know, why, you know, why do Haredim insist on sending their kids to school when everybody else has to sit home? Um, and I tried in some very interesting, I'm not going to take time to go into it. This is really not about me, but, you know, I, it shows, it, since we're talking about communication and diversity, um, despite living in two different worlds for so long, I myself have not yet found a way, and I was a high school debater, a very successful high school debater years ago. Um, and with all of that background, I have never yet managed to put forth what to me seems clear that when we're, and I think we, we touched on it already, you know, a few minutes ago, when we're talking about issues of COVID, there's everything else and there's Torah learning. Um, we all want to see our grandchildren. We all want to go shopping. We all want to get out of the house. But Keeping the yeshivas open, but you know the Torah seminaries, the you know particularly for boys for whom it's religiously more of a an imperative. First of all, just just imperative. We're not talking about preferences and what we like and what we feel. It's not self-expression. It's a legal imperative, a spiritual imperative. Um, to try to explain to somebody that um, we support closing the universities and the offices, but we still insist on sending our kids, at least the boys to study Torah. Um, I can explain up until we are demography and sociology end off. And then when I get to theology, it goes clunk. It just goes clunk. There's no way, maybe if I were Hasidic and I could approach it mystically, I would tap into the new age kind of discourse, but I'm, I'm as far from being new age as anyone could possibly be. Um, religiously and personally. So I don't have that direction. I'm always trying to look for an in. And I said, you just have to understand that for us, learning Torah, like the boys learning Torah, the men learning Torah is the battery that keeps the world afloat. It's not nice. It's not the best way to use your time. It's the most important thing. And without it, like, you know, you, at, at, except for the risk of life, you never stop. You know, people learn Torah in Auschwitz at the risk of their life. People in hospitals, you know, and all sorts in the army, you know, all sorts of settings in Russia, you know, learning Torah is an obligation. And there's literally a fear on theological, I, I, the only word I can use is theology. If you actually believed that if the boys sat home and weren't learning, now they could learn at home, but some of the boys wouldn't be, you know, if you, if you impair, if you undermine learning Torah on a significant sustained level, then the world might go out of existence on some level. You know, it would catastrophic, cataclysmic. Then you can begin to understand that we're talking apples and oranges. It's, it's just we're, we're debating on different realms and it's very hard to have a discussion. Um, I tried that in many different flavors in many different directions. And I got the same answer from modern Orthodox um, audiences, from classes of anthropologists, from medical sociologists, from public health, from STS. Everyone said the same thing. Art museums are important also. And so my answer, that, yes, art museums, I'm not, I'm not here actually to sell you, you know, to try to turn you into ultra-Orthodox, but I'm not, I'm not doing a, uh, a proselytizing job. I'm just trying to explain why my community seems to do things which seem bizarre to you. And as I personally, as, a, as my public health that, I don't agree with everything that happens in my community. There, there are certain things like the mass weddings I'm, I'm, I'm never going to defend, but sending the kids to school um, is something that we should be able to understand. Um, I think one of the things that's very hard, it's, it, you know, religion, the West is fairly secular, the post-Christian West and most academics are fairly secular, even in Israel. And even the modern Orthodox, it's not, it's not guaranteed to really get into the Haredi mindset. So we have to find a way, if we really want to bridge the communication gap, we need to create somehow some sort of discursive space. I've tried and I failed. You, know, you guys are obviously more experienced, more talented. I wish you the best of luck. But I, I've tried everything I know and failed every single time. I'm batting precisely zero. With my debate background, my STS background, my being, you know, sociologist, good luck to you. I'll help you. But that's that's a major challenge. Um, the other interesting thing is that um, living in two worlds and wearing two kinds of hats, it's interesting that my ST, the STS part of my brain is much more anti-science, much more critical of science, and much more aggressive about it than the ultra-Orthodox side of my brain, which is 
basically fairly calm about the whole thing. My personal blood pressure has never risen because of a conflict between Torah and science. They do come up. Um, evolution is one, the age of the universe. I studied astronomy for a year at Columbia as an undergraduate. Um, so, you know, is it 6,000 years or is it 10 to 20 billion years uh, is an issue that comes up. Um, but many times I've asked rabbis, including one rabbi with a PhD in physics from Princeton, and I said, now, I don't understand everything here, but on the, on the basic big picture level, really science and Torah should not really contradict. They shouldn't conflict. I think this is, this is what explains the last two papers also, the findings about the journalism, that the, I, I, you know, I would never have accepted the, presence, the premise that science and Torah are in mortal, you know, mortal combat. Um, and I said, as far as I understand, am I correct that if we if we see conflict, it's because we don't fully understand science, which I'm sure we don't because I, I studied sociology of science and knowledge, and we don't fully understand Torah. Most of us don't. I certainly don't. So if we see a conflict, it's because we're missing something in you know, one of our two knowledge bases. And every ultra-Orthodox rabbi said, yeah, that's it. That's it. So I really don't think there has to be. And some of the journalists in the, you know, I think the middle study, if I'm not mistaken, um, said there isn't that much of a conflict. There are certain things, part of, part of it is that, you know, there is an answer. There is a way that religious people, serious people who have a background in science and for the average Haredi person is not losing sleep over these things. I don't know that the average non-religious person is losing massive sleep on these things one way or another. Um, but to those who are at all interested and notice that there is, you know, some sort of conflict out there, um, there, is a problem with audience. It's a word I would have liked to hear more. It came up, but I, you know, I was trained with the word audience and co-production and things like that. Um, that there are certain things you can say when you're sitting privately, you and a rav, you know, a rabbi, you and somebody quietly, you know, you have a few hours. There, it's not a public audience. And then there are things that you can handle in a soundbite. And I don't think, you know, the closer we get to the soundbite level, the 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 harder, I, I think that the closer we get to the soundbite level of the spectrum or the side of the, the side of the spectrum, the harder it is to handle things with nuance. And you know, these hot button issues can actually be handled, but maybe not for a mass audience, you know, when you have uh, you know 50 words to handle something which is you know subtle and you have all sorts of people reading them. So that's one of the things, you know, an older person and a younger person, a person who has some secular experience, who has no secular experience. These are all um, these are all not to be taken for granted. You have to really think hard, and this is what the, the, the Haredi journalists do. They're thinking very hard about their audience and tailoring the message. Um, and the other thing, and here I'm probably most optimistic, is uh, goodwill. I, I, I sense you know not everyone on this panel is a member of my community, and everyone is very sincere. And I've sat on a few panels where everyone is very sincere, really trying to reach out, trying to find some way to talk to each other. And uh, one of my secular heroes is George Orwell. And I've noticed that, you know, in reading his work, um, I think what's set him apart, he may not have been a great novelist necessarily, but he was looking for the truth. He was looking very hard for the truth. He found the truth and he reported the truth. If you're looking for the truth, it's not always so hard to find and you could write about it. Um, the kind of people who are sincerely looking to understand things honestly and report fairly, there's a much better chance that they can do it. So I think, you know, I sense, I don't know everyone here very, very well, but from the, you know, the way everyone is speaking, I sense that there's a genuine wish to get this right, that we should be able to talk to each other. We should understand each other. And that's more than half the battle. So keep up, keep up. Thank you. David, thank you so much, um, A, for your honesty and for sharing your two hats and, um, and what that means. And I do think that there's so much translation going on here. And I also appreciate your reminder of how complex the situation really is. And that there's, um, you know, um, Bruce started with listening as, as I think the main tool here. And there's so much to do. Um, and listening is, is, the first, is the first step. Um, so thank you. I have much more to say, but what, I, what I'd like to do now is, um, so we have a question from Jane. I'm going to read her question, and then what we're going to do is Oren and Yariv and um, members from my team will, um, you know, answer Jane and some of the questions that David and Ayala have brought up. I know there's a lot of them, so you can pick one or two. 
we have another 25 minutes, but we're three groups. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to read the question. If anything else um, comes up, if people in the audience um, would like to ask more questions, uh, please feel free. I remember there was another question earlier, so I'll find that in a second. But Jane's question, <clears throat> excuse me, is I understand the ultra-Orthodox Jews in the UK are not highly engaged with digital media. Is this typical? Is it another means of exclusion? And can it be worked around both in research and in practice? So with that question, Oren, I'm going to have you go first <laughs> to try, uh, you or Nachi, uh, to answer that. And then if you want to um, respond to some of David and Ayala's uh, comments, and then we'll continue. OK, OK, I'll start with Jane's um, answer, and then I'll say something, with, uh, say something about what Ayala mentioned, maybe. Um, I, I'll say something about, um, in terms of the engagement of the social media, actually, there is a very high rate of social engagement in, in in digital media, I would say not social media, and digital media of the among the ultra orthodox, not all groups. It's true there are some um, some groups that are disengaged um, purposely, and but most but most groups are in one way or another they're connected to the internet, um, and this has gone up by I think by fifteen percent in um, in the past um, in, during the pandemic. There's been some data that it, it went even up a little bit. This um, this um, figure. So that it's close to the what the general population is, not exactly a little bit, still a little bit lower than the general population, and many times uh, many people have um, computers that um, they just domesticate them differently into their houses. Sometimes there's like one computer that's in the center of the house so that they and it's always used filtering um, services, and then there's sometimes that people go to the neighbors or they do other things. Or there's always a way. Um, some people have smartphones, some people don't. Uh, there's a whole thing with smartphones and filtered smartphones. But overall, there is, I think, the, the jewelry in the US is even more open to this, I think, um, to what, from what I know. So that's, um, so that's to answer Jane's um, question. And um, it, it, this is different than the, um, than the televisions, which were, which were banned and other, other forms of media. Um, and that's a whole different story. Uh, and to enter with something that Ayala mentioned earlier, um, Ayala, uh, she, um, you, you asked us a little bit about the, uh, the people that are actually delivering um, this thing, um, the information, um, the, the people that we interviewed, the reporters. And I think there's a change that's going on. Uh, a lot of the, um, I even wrote a paper with Nachi a few years ago about the um, journalism, um, state of journalism, but basically it's I mean, there is the print journalism, which is more old school and is has is is stronger is very strongly connected to the big institutions and the um, party institutions. So it's very um, a kind of politically politically socially biased um, based or sort of you know or biased as well, I would say, and um, and so that's one thing. And there's also the radio, which is um, some of the Shas stuff, the um, the um, uh, Mizrahi. And there's like, there are some differences in those groups. Uh, the younger, the, the, the newer outlets, which are the web outlets are more, I think more interesting and they like really popped up in the last 20 years or so. And they are, um, and they have a lot of younger group people, a lot of people that opted to or didn't fit in the um, religious institutions and the religious tracks, which are considered very highly coveted and have chosen a different kind of, um, vocation and have become power brokers themselves. So they enjoy a lot of power on the one hand as journalists, but on the other hand, they are, um, a, they're, they're sort of a little bit um, a liminal um, figures that can, that can mediate these types of different forms of information between the, the secular world and the, um, so there's a change going on as well here. Yeah. Thank you, Oren. Yariv, would you like to um, answer some of the questions, offer a reflection? I, I don't have much, much to add at this stage. I think Oren did a nice job. <laughs> okay, Ayelet, before I um, start rambling. Okay, so I have a short answer and a question then. Um, so one of the things that Ayala mentioned was that uh, she was she found it interesting that sometimes science becomes uh, not a fact or evidence but an advice, and I wanted to comment that 
I think, well, it's really, really interesting, but I think that's something that also happens outside of the Haredi communities. I think that that happens also with vaccines and climate change and anywhere where people have an ideology or preference or a, an idea or belief that they already hold to or just an inconvenience. I mean, we saw that with, with COVID-19 as well. Uh, if you really want to visit your grandparents or you really want to go to, to do your hair or you really want to do something else for very different reasons, then many times science and regulations and regulations based on science become, become advice. And I'm wondering if what we see in the Haredi community is different or is it simply the same thing? So I have a higher priority of, of but more important values or more important motivations. And then uh, if science doesn't support it, then well, let's forget the science or find another scientist who will say what I, what I need. Um, so that's one. And the second is a question to both David and Bruce, um, because both of you talked about goodwill. And, and, and I want to be also very sincere <laughs> because I, I want, I really want uh, different groups to be included. I, I'm not in the business of excluding anyone. My problem is that while including, while being inclusive, we are being sometimes excluding to other stuff. And by that, I don't mean just the science as was my first question about evolution, but I mean other people. So in the specific case of ultra-Orthodox uh, communities and other uh, religious communities in Israel, including them and being inclusive to their needs means excluding me. <laughs> so it means excluding women. And I must say that if I need to sacrifice, if we need or institutions want to sacrifice uh, women's rights and women's visibility in order to be inclusive to Haredi men, I'm not going to vote for that. And that's actually exactly what's happening in our universities because the government is giving a lot of uh, in financial incentive in order to um, in be inclusive to uh, Haredi men. And that's sometimes lead to the fact that, for example, women cannot teach them and then women are less hired and so forth. So I want to be inclusive. I want, I am sincere, but I don't want to be excluded. So how do we prevent inclusiveness being excluding to someone else? I was gonna let David do that first, but... <laughs> um, I think this is a really serious issue. I mean, I, I, I agree. It's, I mean, this is, you're right. I'm, I'm assuming goodwill, which also means assuming that people will let on, on all sides, will let go of some of their deepest held beliefs, at least for the period of engagement. Um, and what that means is um that there may come a point where institutionally you can't compromise as i said earlier i would not you know leave the evolution out of the museum i might choose to engage outside of the museum in order to build the trust to bring them in but in the university context you're right if inclusion of one group means exclusion of another then, may, then that may not be possible. And so perhaps there's a need for the engagement to happen outside of the university. And perhaps it can only happen with some groups. I mean, as um, I think Leah said very early on, the Haredi is not one thing, um, that there are many communities. And so there may be parts of the community that one can engage with and hope that some of them will engage with the ones that you can't engage with. Um, uh, and so that may require sort of long-term strategic issues. Um, it does ultimately depend on goodwill and on those people in all communities who are willing to find the spaces where you can engage. 
um, I yell it. I remember a time when you and I went to visit um, a museum and our host was Haredi and um, chose not to shake your hand or the hand of um, the other woman who was with us, but who welcomed you into the space, right? To, for us to, to have the conversation we were having. Um, we, yes, that was difficult, but that's also a place where engagement of some kind was possible. Um, I, I don't know, this is, this is a really, you know, these are not simple things that, that we're, we're trying to do. Um, and that's why I, and, and it's one of the reasons why, it's one of the challenges is that we come to this because we think there's something relatively, we're looking for the simple answer. We're looking for the, how can we get more people to get vaccinated? How can we get more people to practice social distancing? And what we're finding is that those um, those turn out not to be simple things. And they turn out not to be just because we're not speaking the right language, but because there are these deep beliefs, what David referred to as the fear that he and his, his Haredi colleagues feel about not sending their, their boys to be, to be studying Torah. That it's not a, it's not a preference. It's, it's part of their identity. It's part of who they are. Um, and that's a, that's not something, identity is not something that we can sort of quickly change. So I, I don't have a simple answer. What I'm looking for are the small steps that we can take and looking for the spaces where we can engage um, while being conscious on all sides that we are start. Also, I said, don't be defensive in my talks, but there will be places where you do need to be defensive. So you look for the spaces where you can not be defensive and see if maybe you can slowly enlarge those spaces. Um, if I have a minute to, to add to what Bruce said, I can just sort of come in slightly from the, here I will speak with uh, my Khalidi hat. Um, I found, and I'm one of these people that doesn't shake hands. I found that if you bow politely, you know, you do something else with your hands or I explain in advance that I'm very friendly and I get along with everyone. I just can't, and in my community, we don't shake hands with ladies, but, um, I look at it as goodwill plus red lines. Very often our red lines are firmer, less flexible, and we're very aware of them more than, you know, for example, in my department, when they started to look to recruit people to teach in the ultra-Orthodox program, <clears throat> uh, several professors, I was not among them, but several were very angry that it was suggested that women should not teach the men. And I said, hey, fine, we just won't send the men. You know, I would never let my kids near a program where there were women teachers, you know, men. I would never send my boys to a program where there were women. Fine, it doesn't have to be one. You know, not everything is negotiable. Um, I'm very aware of my red lines. The other side, you know, the other side, you know, the secular side has their red lines. Um, but I always summarize it by saying, you know, you can eat with me in a kosher restaurant, but I cannot eat with you in a non-kosher restaurant. You know, there are certain things that I just can't, with all the will in the world, there are certain things I just can't participate in and I won't. Um, and it's not even just a question of my identity, it's a question of the law. Now, this is a very dry, you know, non-emotional, um, Litvak, Yeka, you know, like a Lithuanian German, not, you know, the Hasidic, mystical, whatever. But uh, before Torah is anything else, it's the law. It's just the law. I'm not interested in breaking the law. I stopped going to, I went to graduation for decades at Bar Ilan um, and I had a, a a patented sort of a thing. After I was sucked in the first year and no one told me what happened, I was stuck on the dais as a young, I think barely understood Hebrew. And then every graduate, 95% females got up and shook all the faculty's hands. I said, oh my God, I can either embarrass, you know, 85 women in front of their whole families or um, I could break law, you know, break the law. And I sort of figured to myself very quickly that I can't embarrass all these students in front of them by ostentatiously not speaking, you know, not taking their hands. So I shook hands. And then the person who invited me, you know, the senior faculty, you, that was a problem for you, right? I said, yeah, this will never happen again. Don't worry. So I go to graduation and we have this kind of graduation and I sort of sit on the end and I just quietly slip off the dais and disappear into the audience whenever the students line up to shake our hands. And then I'm forced to either not go to graduation or walk out of graduation when the lady sings, which is the way that things happen now. I stopped going to graduation when they decided to have women sing. That's a red line. It's not, I, I don't want to make a statement. I don't want to, um, 
uh, reinforce my identity. I just don't want to break the law. It's very dry and very simple. I can't break the law. If I know in advance I'm going to have to break the law, I just don't do it. I disappear. Um, so very often, you know, I, I can easily understand how a colleague would feel that compromising on, you know, ethnically or gender, you know, making gender selections, um, you know, sort of gender apartheid that women can't teach the uh, can't teach the male students is a is a red line for them. I would say my colleagues have two or three red lines. I've got like 17 of them. And that's it. So then really we, assuming we're all serious about our red lines, then from the beginning, we assume that we'll just work around them. We, our overlap, our discursive space or our space for communication is between the red lines. And we all realize we have them. And then that still leaves plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, room for us to accomplish something. But we, you know, if they're clashing red lines, so that's not the best place to start collaborating. That's all. David, thank you so much um, for your comments, and um, thank you, Bruce, as well for your um, thoughts on this. I, I think you're both reminding us again how tricky this is, and I wanted to offer um, two more thoughts, uh, which uh, are in a bit of a different direction. One is. Um, Daniela Ovadia had put something in the Q&A a while back and I wanted to, to speak about it. So I wanna just remind us what she asked and then I'll say two more things is that, um, so Daniela asked, should we, how, how, how much we should consider the status of a minority? And I think that um, the status of, um, of different groups makes a really big difference. When we're talking about ultra-Orthodox Haredi Jews in Israel, compared to um, their status in other communities. And I also want to remind us that there are other religious minorities in other contexts. And in every context, there are very different configurations of historical relations between those states and the religious minorities, some of which come very much linked to science and to health. And sometimes it's broader questions. But I think that if we're looking for these spaces for nuance and for communication, then we have to understand those histories and we have to understand the genealogies of power in particular contexts. And, and that's why I think I'm stressing not only that it's a case about religion and inclusion, but it's also understanding the politics of particular um, groups. And that's why I think that using the word minority is important when it's relevant. Um, so that's just something I wanted to put on the table that I think is really, really important. And to go back to Ben's question in the beginning about science and politics, that to those of us who do sociology and anthropology um, or science communication, we, we get the politics, but I think that we need to think about that really seriously. And the other thing that I wanted to talk about, even though I have a lot, but I think it also kind of goes to our conversation now about alliances and where alliances can happen. Ayala, you were speaking about um, kind of these alliances during COVID between um, Haredi Jews and anti-vaxxers. And I think we can learn a lot um, from those moments as well, both in terms of where we can create bridges um, and more inclusive communication, but also where that happens in other spaces. Um, so there are, um, you know, in, in, in the effort to make science communication more inclusive, and to have people understand that, you know, it's not just advice, it's, it's a little bit more than that. So we see a lot of groups, sometimes they're religious and sometimes there are other reasons um, that people aren't taking this advice. Um, and what's interesting is that sometimes people who are very different will sometimes come together at these moments. And I think that it just, it makes it even more, um, more powerful how we have to listen to our audience, I think, which is something that you had said, Bruce, um, from the beginning, that it's not just about thinking about how to communicate science, but thinking about the audience that is going to read this, that's going to listen to this, and really tailoring um, by, uh, by listening to the particularities so we can um, help make sense of this. Um, would anybody else like to offer another reflection, another question? We have five more minutes and then um, we'll have to say our thank yous to everyone. Ayala. You're, you're on mute. 
I know. I, I actually knew that I was. <laughs> I just couldn't undo it. Um, I do have a question um, in the comparative mode. Um, and thank you for that kind of summing up. I think that's super helpful. One of the things I've been seeing um, is um, in terms of a religious minority in the U.S., has been this use of the idea of religious freedom. And so in terms of minority, um, those alliances are with other religious groups. And I've been really interested to try to track that. I think that's something relatively new. And I do think it's related to voting patterns. You know, So many ultra-Orthodox Jews voted for Trump in the States. Um, and I wondered if you were seeing something similar or how that compared because religious minorities are having a kind of moment um, of power in the United States. Um, and I think changing some of the discourse in terms of public health mandates in particular. Um, and, and that is at the point of personal freedom, that discourse. Would somebody like to offer? Bruce, are you? Um... Yeah, so so one of the things, I mean, I think the, 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 the quick thought that occurs to me is that this is one of those places where we're focusing on the values and how they are different in different contexts is of what we have to listen to. So I think the fact that you've observed that is is an interesting point and is, you know, I haven't really thought about that so much and, and um, need to do that. And that would be very different in Israel, which has a different conception of religious uh, freedoms or um, Danielle's uh, question from Italy, um, a very different setting there um, with the different, both both a different alignment of religions and a different understanding of the place of religion in public life um, and in legal life um, as well. So that I think part of the challenge here is we can't give a single answer because it's gonna vary in each context, um, but we have to be observant of those, of those issues. Um, and again, find those spaces that are between the red lines, as David put it, where we can find a space to talk about them um, and, and understand them and understand what the values are that are underneath, that are underlying them. Um, again, this is part of my belief that, you know, that we can find those spaces. Um, Ayala is worried that we can't. Um, but um, I hope that we can. Um, per, per, perhaps if, if I could say something, um, perhaps there is uh, like two different things going on. One is the disempowerment or identification in the politics of this Biden era, maybe, or something, or post Trump era. We could, could also look at it that way. Um, at looking at minorities and emphasizing their, their, their significance or whatever. Uh, after after a very brutal kind of uh, um, uh, treatment that, that was earlier. But um, on the other hand, there's also um, a need for solidarity, a, a stronger call for solidarity that comes from the, um, from the pandemic, that we need to look for common ideals and common understandings of science and life and, religion, and, and all kinds of things. And, and the epistemology, we, we, we're looking for a commonality and, and, and it, there isn't because we now, it's, it, so it surfaces all the problems and the, um, and the differences are actually being um, surfaced more um, when we start looking for, uh, and then there's the pro-vaxxers and anti-vaxxers and all these groups that are, um, that they're tagging on to their primordial identities more or less, I think. In, in some ways, and some some that does works and some doesn't. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. Oh, and thank you. Thank you so much for that. And um, we're kind of coming towards an end of our, of our time together. And I, um, I want to thank everybody um, for coming, for being in this conversation. This is the second session. The first session was also um, very powerful, highlighting kind of the, the challenges of having these conversations. I'm really happy that we're having them. I want to thank um, the teams, both from the Technion and from Haifa, Ayelet, Yael, Oren, and Yariv, and Nachi, who somehow did not get back on with some technical difficulties. But, you know, we're trying to do something and we're happy to be in conversation. Thank you, Ayala, David, and Bruce for joining us 
on this. And I thought maybe just to end with, um, Bruce, you had called in the beginning when we were talking about what to find inclusive science communication. You had given us three, besides listening, you gave us three things to think about. Um, intentionality, um, reciprocity, and reflexivity, which I think are three key things that besides listening can guide our scholarship and can guide our search um, for spaces. And as, um, as Oren put it, um, the COVID, has showed, the COVID uh, pandemic has showed us that we really are in this together. Um, so thank you all. Stay in touch if you did not put something in the Q&A and want to be in touch with us. Um, it's pretty easy to find us. And um, thank you all praying for some peace and quiet times. Um, and thank you for joining us and stay in touch. Thank you. Oh, and thank you. Uh, and thank you, Leah, for organizing this and being so sincere. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much Very to nice. the organizers. Fascinating. Thank Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.